Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much um, for the very kind introduction and also to all of the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you here today. So I decided um, today to give more of a broad sort of overview talk um, rather than dig deeply into a particular um, set of results. So um, I'm hoping to um, uh, communicate a, a vision for the field as it currently stands where it could go um, and, and opportunities for change. So with that, um, the outline that I have uh, put together covers three distinct topics. The first is the why and how of network neuroscience. Um, then we'll move into what I think is a really exciting current opportunity, and that's the use of network control theory to understand human cognition. Um, and then in the third section, I'd like to expand from brains to people. So I'll head straight into the first part um, and note that there is a unique and exciting challenge in distilling explanations of cognition in humans, but also in non-human animals. Um, we know now uh, over from work over the past several decades that cognitive functions are not explained well by the activity of a single brain region. Instead, there's a constellation of brain regions and their structural or functional connections that are required uh, to explain cognitive functions. And this complexity produces the really wonderful cognition and behavior that we enjoy as humans, but it also complicates interventions when these functions go awry. And I'll be talking a little bit about more about that complication in the second part of the talk. Um, but this, this fact um, that we can't distill cognition down into the workings of a single region has motivated the use of network science for understanding how many different brain regions are connected up with one another and work together with one another to enable the cognitive functions that we have. So network science is a really natural language in which to frame these complex constellations of regions and their connections. It's also an emerging academic field um, that studies complex networks across many different different areas in physics, in biology, in computer science, um, and elsewhere. And it considers the distinct elements of the system, as well as the connections between those distinct elements, and in particular tries to understand how the pattern of connections between elements enables um, uh, higher order functions of the system. So when viewing the brain as a graph or a network, it requires us to sort of refocus from uh, the unique contribution of individual brain regions to the pattern of connections in neural systems. And by doing that, I think it has helped us as a field to push the conceptual boundaries of how we think about cognition um, and, and how we think about how dynamics emerge from this particular complex system. And and simultaneously, it opens up opportunities to use the growing mathematics um, in network science. So when I think about the contributions of network neuroscience to how we think about the brain and how we think about neural systems, I think of two uh, particular um, benefits. One is that network science is a very flexible framework that is applicable to many different data types. And we know as, as those who work in neuroscience um, that there are many data types available to us, many kinds of measurements, especially depending on whether we are focusing on human or non-human um, organisms. But also even within a single organism, um, there are structural data types, functional data types, and others. Um, but it's flexible, so across those data types, but also in testing diverse hypotheses. And then the second contribution that I think is, is important to note is that the field provides statistical tools as well as algorithms and theories that have previously been and are continuing to be developed in mathematics, in physics, in engineering, um, and computer science. And uh, with the sort of bringing together of neuroscience and network science, I think it's important for us to um, acknowledge the fact that the, the network representation of a neural system is inherently a model and makes particular modeling assumptions. And I think that's important because um, the network representation itself is not meant to be and cannot be interpreted as a full um, explanation of the system, but it can be thought of as a pared down, simple, parsimonious model of, what, of how the system is constructed and what the system may be constructed to do. So if network science um, is a modeling endeavor, 
when used in neuroscience, what are some of the assumptions that are present? Well, the first is that you can separate the system into cleanly delineated units. Um, if you uh, can't separate the system into cleanly delineated units, then network science is certainly not the modeling um, type that is relevant for your system. The second assumption underlying the use of network science in neuroscience is that you can define the most salient relations or connections between units. If there are not salient connections or relations between units, then again, network science is not really the right modeling approach to be using. And then the third assumption is that from the structure of the connectivity pattern, we can learn something about the system's organization, perhaps make educated guesses about its function, and build models of its development, growth, and evolution. So if we are studying a system where that connectivity pattern actually doesn't tell us about organization or about function or about development, growth, and evolution, then again, network science may not be the, the right approach. I think from the last um, two decades, it's very clear that the network um, model for neural systems um, at least partially uh, satisfies these three assumptions. But I think each time that we use the network approach for neuroscience data, it's important to think through what these assumptions are and um, how they are uh, satisfied by, by the, the particular model that we are building. And so that leads me to um, the next set of questions that I think the field has been wrestling with, which is how do we assess the efficacy and merit of network models once we've built them? Um, and I think that the answer is that there are multiple ways of evaluating and testing the validity of network models. And I really do think very, very strongly that the validity of a particular network model will depend on the goals of its use and the domains of its application. So I don't think that there's one way of assessing the validity of a particular network model. I also don't think that there's one network model that's necessarily the right one, um, but that in each case, we need to think about how the network model was built, um, what the goals are for its use, Use, what data it's using, and what the outcome is. What are we using it for? Um, so with that broader context in mind, I think that there are at least three different types of validity that we could be um, considering. And the first and simplest would be uh, descriptive validity. So descriptive validity addresses the question of whether the model resembles in some key ways the system that it was constructed to model. And this kind of validity aligns with questions about how well the specific pattern of nodes and edges matches the anatomical and or functional data that it represents. And so if you're building a model that matches where the connectivity pattern matches that of the data, then you have descriptive validity. You are describing the data in front of you as a network. And I think that the majority of work in the um, space of network neuroscience has, has done a really good job of thinking through descriptive validity. But I think that's not where we as a field want to stop. I think we want to push forward into um, explanatory validity, for example, which focuses on um, a theoretical construct used to develop statistical tests and support conclusions drawn from the use of the model. It addresses whether a network's architecture can be justified from the data and then used to test for causal relations to dynamics or to behavior. So this moves sort of a step beyond descriptive validity and asks, is this network model useful to explain? And if so, what is it explaining? And then the third um, kind of validity that I think is really exciting and that the field is increasingly pushing towards is predictive validity. This occurs where there's a correspondence between a model's response to a perturbation and the organism's response to a perturbation. That perturbation could be a drug, an electrical or chemical stimulation, neurofeedback, for example, or simply training. And when there is this correspondence between the organism and the model, then we have attained descriptive uh, validity. So with validated models in hand, what questions do we then ask? I think that as the field has moved over the last um, couple of years, it's clear that we are rethinking um, our conceptions of computation from a network perspective. And there's this really wonderful um, review article from Dink and colleagues in 2012 in Nature Reviews Neuroscience that I think is, is illustrative of this move. 
how do we think about computation, not in single units, but in groups of units, in small motifs of connected uh, units that then produce something broader than could be obtained from a single unit itself. We also are using uh, the network approach to think quite differently about human development. So um, to complement the understanding of how uh, cortical morphology may change over the course of um, development and over the lifespan, or how um, gray matter volume or cortical thickness in a particular region of the brain may change over development. We are thinking increasingly about also the pattern of connections between brain regions um, that changes in a meaningful way over development in and meaningful in the sense that changes in a way that supports the the um, alterations in cognitive function that accompany development, but then also accompany um, later age. The approach and the sort of perspective has also altered how we think about pathology, whether that's in um, neurological uh, disease or psychiatric disorders. So um, rather than, than thinking solely about how a particular region of the brain may be altered in a particular uh, neurological disease or psychiatric disorder, we are increasingly thinking about what circuit, what pattern of connections are altered and how, um, and how that alteration in the network is productive of the um, pathological signatures that we see in symptomatology or outcomes. And I also think that the approach is changing how we think about interventions. So how we think about um, clinical interventions in particular, but also training interventions in healthy individuals. Rather than thinking, again, just about altering a single brain region, we are increasingly asking questions about how a change in one brain region may alter the flow of information to other regions. And that, and um, to the degree that that is so, we, uh, that urges us, that moves us to think about intervening on the network as a whole in multiple points, multiple, for example, control points that might push the entire system towards a more healthy um, state. So that, I, I want to focus on that last section in a little bit more depth. What are network interventions and how can we build a theory for them? And so that brings me to the second part of the talk where I would like to discuss what I think of as a really exciting current opportunity in the field. And that's the use of network control theory to understand um, cognitive functions as well as interventions in the context of disease. So what is network control theory? Well, network control theory is a mathematical framework that determines which perturbations to the system can drive the whole system to a desired state. So let me walk you through these two um, simple schematics. Here on the left hand side is a simple network with four nodes and four edges that are directed. These purple arrows indicate um, the uh, injection of signals into node X1 and then into node X2. The signal that's being injected is illustrated here as U1, a function of time, and U2, a function of time. And um, what network control theory is meant to do is to ask what are the U1s and U2s that can be injected into this little network system in order to drive the activity states of these four nodes to um, into a particular uh, regime. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you the state space. So here we have four axes, x1, x2, x3, and x4, corresponding to the four nodes on the left hand side. The initial state of the system was at the origin, and we're interested in pushing the system to a final desired state, which is a coordinate in this four dimensional space with activation of a particular kind on the four nodes. This approach is typically applied to the study of the power grid, to mechanical systems, air traffic control systems, and robotics. But I think increasingly it's become clear that this approach is also really useful for thinking about neural systems. So how would we translate what I just described to you for a generic network system to a neural system specifically? Well, what we can do is that we can define a trajectory 
of a neural system to be a temporal path that the system traverses through a diverse set of states, where a state is defined as the magnitude of neurophysiological activity across all brain regions at a single time point. And you can think about this as a single measurement in fMRI, so at a single TR, or a single measurement um, in calcium imaging in a non-human uh, animal, or you can think about it as a measurement of power across brain regions um, using electroencephalography uh, or magnetoencephalography or intracranial um, electrocorticography, for example. In each of the cases, you have a pattern of activity across the brain region and what your brain regions. And what you're asking is, how would the system move from that pattern of activity to another pattern of activity? With um, that sort of uh, setup in your mind, we can then ask questions about the controllability of the network. And the controllability of the network refers to the possibility to manipulate network components, so specifically the nodes in the system, um, to drive the system along a desired trajectory and that is a set of states that culminate in a target state, which might be chosen um, for its functional utility. Now, I want to ask the question of how does control theory differ from communication models, which are also very typically and um, increasingly used in the field to understand um, neural dynamics. And I think that the two uh, approaches are very complementary and have distinct um, and complementary goals. The goals of communication models, um, the specific the singular goal, uh, is to capture the evolution of communication dynamics, typically by using dynamical models, um, and then to characterize the process of signal propagation perhaps using graph theoretical or statistical measures. So the communication models start with a network and implement a particular dynamics upon that network and ask how uh, regions communicate with one another given their pattern of connections. I think that, and so in that sense, it's sort of forward looking. It's, it's let's take the network and let's propagate this, um, this activity through the system using a particular dynamical model. Control has a, has a different, um, goal, which is to determine what intervention strategies could navigate the system from an initial state to a target state. So it's a little bit more concrete about both the initial state and the target state, and also ask the more practical question of how to move from one state to another. So rather than just simulating forward into time, it's asking how do I move the system in a particular way on the energy landscape that the system is moving on. So um, with that general goal in mind, we can ask what are the inputs and outputs of network control theory? And there are two inputs to the approach and um, a set of outputs. The inputs are number one, a mapping of the network, and number two, a model of the dynamics. And so in this, um, because it has these two inputs, we can see that network control theory is quite different from graph theory, for example, or um, other approaches that use network metrics as uh, statistical um, descriptors. And uh, the reason that it's different is that it includes this model of dynamics in addition to the map of the network. So let's walk through these three in turn. First, we'll start with the mapping of the network, then we'll go to a model of dynamics, and then finally I'll discuss a few of the, the um, perturbations. So to map the network in a human, we would typically use something like diffusion tractography to map out the pattern of white matter connections between brain regions. Whereas in other um, non-human animals, we might use track tracing or electron microscopy or some other method that allows us to look at the structural connections um, between brain regions or smaller neural units. Now let's turn to the model of dynamics. Oh, sorry, before I do that, I want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of um, network maps. So what has been used most commonly in the field so far in the context of network control is structural connectivity. So what are the structural connections between different brain regions? The advantage of this approach is that is, it allows us to model the physical propagation of signals along the white matter track but there are two disadvantages that I think I want, I want to be clear about up front. The first one is that the, um, this structural connectivity, particularly in humans as measured by um, diffusion imaging, does not allow for the propagation of signals through local tissue. Um, so from one gray matter region to another gray matter region that are, that are actually um, abutting one another. And um, that's 
that's a problem because there are there is the possibility of electrical signaling to move through gray matter without going down into white matter and back up again. And so the solution to this advantage is to add in what's called a touching matrix, uh, which reflects the pattern of physical abutment of brain areas. And this is important because brain areas at the large scale are not discrete units sort of uh, hanging in space. Uh, they are, you know, pieces of a volume uh, of tissue that are that are right next to one another. The second disadvantage of structural connectivity is that some states of the brain may privilege the flow of information along some tracks more than others, or in some directions more than others. Um, and structural connectivity will not uh, provide you with that information. So a solution to that disadvantage is to instead use effective connectivity matrices um, effective connectivity matrices assess the current pattern of connections that are being used in a particular cognitive state or um, dynamical state. Um, as an example of this, uh, uh, Brittany Scheid just wrote a paper that came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year that uses effective connectivity matrices and network control. Um, there's also some work that we've been pushing forward to understand multi-layer networks, for example, in moving beyond structural connectivity to also understand um, patterns of, of um, vasculature, vasculature networks, and the, uh, the relationship between the two that may inform the dynamics that are possible and the energy landscape on which the brain is moving. So now I'd like to move to the second input to network control theory, which is the model of dynamics. And there are at least three kinds of models that we could think about. The first one is the simplest. So it would be a linear time invariant model. And here, um, what we have is the state of the brain XT being equal to the state of the brain at the previous time step times the pattern of connections between brain regions. So that's this A matrix, and then plus the control input. So U is the control input as a function of time. B is a matrix, typically with ones along the diagonal that indicate which regions the input is being injected into. Um, and then if we're not measuring at the actual state X, we're measuring something else, um, then that something else is Y, uh, and the, um, the true state is X, which may be multiplied by some um, matrix that alters it to what we actually measure. So that's the simplest one. Um, linear time varying models would be the next one, and that is next most complicated. That's where the adjacency matrix, so the structural connectivity, may change in time. Or maybe it's not the structural. So at the synaptic level, that would be true. Um, at the uh, large scale whole brain level for a human, um, these may be effective connectivity matrices that change with time, depending on cognitive state or dynamical state, for example. And then we can move from the linear models uh, to nonlinear models. So this is a, a movement from the least complex to the uh, more complex. So we could ask, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different kinds of dynamical models? Well, in the first, the linear time invariant models, these are nice because they're simple enough to provide some analytical intuitions. So you can actually do some math on them, which is really nice and satisfying. Um, they're extensively developed machinery for various control strategies in this linear regime. Um, and they're definitely you know, a useful first approximation for nonlinear dynamics particularly accurate in the vicinity of the operating point. So those are some, some um, advantages of, of using the linear models. For the time varying models, these are useful for studying context dependent dynamics and for developing and understanding context specific control strategies. These can build on the very well-developed tools for estimating effective connectivity matrices, like structural equation modeling, or dynamic causal modeling, or um, transfer entropy. And then when we move to nonlinear models, these are particularly helpful for scenarios, scenarios when whole sectors of the state space might be prohibited. Um, and I'd like to point out this really wonderful paper from Adelson Motter in Chaos in 2015, as well as the Cornelius et al. Nature Communications 2013 paper. Both of these address nonlinear um, uh, models for network control theory, and I think they're really excellent. Um, contributions in this space. So if there are sectors of the state space that are not physiologically possible or not accessible, um, then moving to nonlinear models is really is really critical.
So, okay, we've talked about the two inputs, mapping of the network and then modeling of the dynamics. The last um, bit I wanted to talk through in this section is the design of perturbations. Um, so what are some of the outputs of network control theory? The first and probably simplest is what's called the impulse response. So this is a system's output when presented with a brief input signal. Um, so here what you see is a simple network where a stimulation has been injected into node I and may travel along these pathways to some node J. Here is a plot of the activity of those nodes as a function of time. As you can see, node I's activity rises first because of the stimulation, and node J's activity rises later because the stimulation took time to travel along the connection to get to node J. Um, the area under the curve is then the impulse response. For some models of dynamics, the impulse response can be solved for analytically, and that's nice because it removes the need for a simulation and offers um, a greater opportunity for mathematical intuition. Now, if we move one step beyond the impulse response, we get to the controlled response. So this is the system's response to some controlling input, U of T, so not just a ping, but an actual time varying input. Um, and here is an example of what we mean. Here's a network that will have stimulation injected into, for example, three different spots, and it'll be time varying. The peach node gets an, an injection of input both here and here. The blue node gets two injections of input and the purple node gets one. For a linear system, uh, the controlled response will have two components. The first will be the impulse response, which we just discussed. And then the second one will be a convolution of the mapped inputs, BU, with the impulse response. So this is a nice separation of the controlled response into these two pieces, which again provides us with some nice intuition. Now, the third Imp or sorry, output of network control theory is achieving a desired state transition. So um, because the map from the impulse to the response is known because we've written down a particular model of di the dynamics, we can design a mapped input BU to drive a desired response XT. Now I want to note that there can be multiple solutions here. So multiple BUs that would drive the same um, this, let's drive the system to our target state. It's not that there's necessarily just one solution. There may be multiple solutions. And that multiplicity then motivates us to think about um, whether that state transition is, is more difficult, so we're requiring more control uh, input, more of U of T, or less. Um, and that brings us to this question of controllability. So a system is controllable if there's a control input that brings us from an initial state to a desired final state in finite time, but we may be interested not just in whether that's possible, but also we may be interested in a substate of a subset of initial and final states um, that would push the system locally on the um, energy landscape or more globally on the energy landscape or with different amounts of energy. And so that brings us to this output, the minimum energy control. So it's not just asking whether you can push the system, whether there is some U of T that can get you there, but, but which U of T can be used um, to minimize the amount of um, energy expenditure. So one um, approach to that question is to minimize U um, as we move through this trajectory from an initial state X naught to a final state XT. And the very last, um, part of this that I wanted to raise is how do you know if you've made the right choices? How do you know if you've made the right choices in terms of the map of the network, the model of the dynamics, and the design of the perturbation? And again, as with all modeling efforts, the answer is going to depend on the scientific question. So we can again ask in terms of descriptive validity, does the network map and or the model of dynamics match the data? Then we can move beyond that and ask about explanatory validity. Do the outputs correlate with a behavior, cognition, or symptoms? Does the theory provide candidate explanations of mechanism or cause? And then we can move to predictive validity. Does the framework predict the future response of the system to stimulation? And can it predict behavior, cognition, and symptoms? The question spaces that the field is currently tackling include modeling cognitive control as a network control process, 
Here, um, some examples are assessments of executive function and dysfunction and its development, but also relevant here are studies of the energy landscape modulation that can accompany the use of drugs or the use of placebo. The second set of questions that is being tackled is um, using network control to better understand the functional consequences of altered brain structure in disease states like epilepsy, bipolar, and schizophrenia, but also relevant here are assessments of the heritability of network control statistics. And then third, we can use network control to better understand brain dynamics in response to tasks. So for example, in a resting state versus a visual processing state, working memory state, or brain computer interface control. Also relevant here are studies probing control energy as a marker of cognitive effort. And the fourth is using network control to better understand brain response to stimulation, particularly in the design of personalized stimulation paradigms um, that uh, embrace the structure of white matter organization in that particular individual. Now, now that we've done a deep dive into network control theory, I want to kind of come back out again um, and, and uh, stay at this broader uh, scale of where the field is. So typically, network models have been applied to the scale of brain regions, uh, in humans at least, and the question is where has the field expanded to since? Well, I think it's expanded to think much more in a multi-scale way. So in the first um, uh, expansion, I think, is moving from the large scale brain activity, which provides a really nice coarse grain encoding of neural processes, but down to cellular dynamics that can shape the regional dynamics that we understand. So thinking now both about neuronal networks, so cellular uh, networks, as well as regional networks, and how these two might relate to one another. How do cellular processes shape circuit behavior? And that multi-layer, multi-scale expansion moves even further, both to the smaller scales um, of molecular networks and up to larger scales of social networks. So when we move down um, to molecular mechanisms, we can think about what molecular mechanisms affect large scale brain network function. Um, and understanding that relationship is really critical for the development of effective pharmacological interventions. So we can ask questions like, how do genetic material and epigenetic drivers shape circuit behavior across spatial scales? And we can also move up, so beyond a single brain region, but to a whole uh, social network of um, individuals and ask questions about how single brains shape the social networks around us, but also how the social networks around us shape the brain. And this may feel like a very you know, broad uh, a question that is not yet accessible to data, but in fact it, it is. And individuals, um, there's a whole uh, set of investigators who are understanding the structure of single brain regions and the structure of the social networks around them and relating the two to one another. So we really are starting to understand how the networks in a single mind relate to social networks around them and vice versa. And I'm really excited about this expansion. So that brings me to the very last section of the talk where I would like to move um, from brains uh, to people. So how are we going to do that? I want to pose some questions here. How can we take the lens of network science brought to neural systems and apply it to neuroscience as a field? So how is our field like a network and why might that be important and can or should we intervene in this network to and to what new state could it be pushed so let's make those questions a little bit more concrete how would we move from brain regions to brain people which is us right people who study brains um, so we'll move from a network of neurons to a network of neuroscientists. And instead of having the network represent the connectivity between regions and ask questions like, is the brain composed of independent units, we'll instead ask, um, we'll, we'll instead study a network where each uh, node is a person person I, person J, and they may relate to one another by how they cite one another's work, how they engage with one another's ideas, and we'll ask questions like, is our field composed of and our work done by independent scholars, or are we doing this work together in a collaborative way that's evinced by, by the citations that we used to mark whose ideas we're working with and working around and working among?
So this brings us to thinking through um, the citation networks in our field as a marker for collaboration, for ideas, um, and for the sort of progress in our field intellectually. Citation networks are networks that define not just neuroscience, but, but kind of any field. And there's a growing uh, group of researchers in bibliometrics and science of science that are studying citation networks as markers of, of the field structure. And in fact, um, Sarah Ahmed has uh, very um, strikingly called citations academic bricks. And she's called them academic bricks for a couple reasons. I think um, the first way in which citations are academic bricks is that they are building blocks of academic careers. So they are frequently seen as a marker of success. Um, they are sometimes used to determine compensation and promotion. They're often evaluated in the context of grants and other funding awards, as well as collaborative opportunities and speaking engagements. But the second way in which citations are academic bricks is that they are building blocks of our fields of inquiry. Citations form a network map of the scholarly fields that we are engaging in. They define kind of spaces of inquiry. What questions are we asking? What ideas are we using? What experiments are we um, uh, building upon, and they determine the scope of the questions considered, as well as serving as, as a really nice record of the history of scientific ideas. So as academic bricks then, citations can build a more diverse scientific community, or they can erect walls of exclusion. And so I wanted to show you some relatively new data that we have studying citation networks in neuroscience and a, a really um, sort of sobering assessment of the way in which race and ethnicity of individuals is um, clearly uh, evinced by the citation network patterns. So what we did is that we studied over 60,000 articles in the top five neuroscience journals from 1995 to 20. 2019. And what we did is we asked, well, how many citations would each of those um, papers be expected to uh, get given the, um, the date of the publication, so how old it is, the journal that the paper was published in, the seniority of the first and last authors, whether the paper was a review article or an empirical article, and a couple other factors. So after building this statistical model, which um, is uh, shown here in the lighter pastel colors, we then asked how many citations did each group get? Um, and we categorized groups, well, individuals or papers into four groups. The first one is where the first author is predicted to be white and the last author is predicted to be white. And so that's this dark purple. And then on the right-hand side, what you see is when the first author is predicted to be an author of color and the last author is predicted to be an author of color. These predictions of race and ethnicity are drawn from um, the names of the individuals. There are, uh, we use machine learning algorithms that can extract the probability of someone coming from a particular race and ethnicity given the linguistic structure of their first and last names. And so what you can see from these data is that the papers that have a predicted white first and last author are oversighted by about 8% um, compared to what you would expect based on these other factors, whereas papers from authors of color are undersighted by 17.2%. And papers that have um, the mixed uh, authorship are here uh, in the middle. So what we find is that reference lists tend to include um, more papers with a white person as first and last author than would be expected if race and ethnicity were unrelated to referencing. We also show that this imbalance is largely driven by the citation practices of white authors, so people like me, um, and is increasing over time as the field diversifies. Now we can show the same sort of thing in relation to gender rather than race or ethnicity. So here is the same sort of plot, the percent over and under citation along the y-axis. In the first bin is papers that have a predicted man as the first and last author, and in the last bin are papers with a predicted woman as a first and last author. The first group is being oversighted by about 13%, and the woman-woman papers are being undersighted by 30%. 
Um, so in this case, we are finding, and this one was um, recently published, we find that reference lists tend to include more papers with men as first and last author than would be expected if gender were unrelated to referencing. And we also show that this imbalance is largely driven by the citation practices of the majority group um, and is increasing over time as the field diversifies. I want to take those two pieces of data and, and sort of cross them for you so that you can see the effect of intersectionality. So what I'm doing here again in neuroscience is to show the first author along the um, y axis and then the last author along the x axis and we have the predictions for race and ethnicity as well as for gender so the M will stand for man and the W will stand for woman. And the four groups that we will have in terms of race and ethnicity are white, Asian, Hispanic, and black. So what you can see here, uh, the color is the percent over and under citation. What you can see is a very clear gender effect. That's this big block diagonal structure, where in the top left, you can see an over citation of man-man papers on average. And on the, uh, on the bottom right, you can see an under citation of the woman-woman papers on average. And then if you look inside each of these blocks, you can see the race and ethnicity effects. And I'll just pull out the sort of top and bottom uh, to give you a feel for it. So the most oversighted are the papers papers that have a predicted white man in the first and last position. And the most undersighted over here are the one papers that have a predicted black woman as a first and last author. Um, and the difference in these is about, you know, 20, 24% oversighting, 47% undersighting is over 70 percentage points difference, which as you can imagine, could have a, a marked impact on um, scientific success, compensation, promotion, et cetera. Interestingly, again, just to note, these effects are largely driven by the majority race and the majority gender and are increasing with time in neuroscience. So I want to talk through what some factors are that could explain these citation dis disparities. Um, one of the really key factors that we've noted is that um, the papers that are most uh, the, re the reference lists that are most imbalanced are those that are citing like it's 1995. And I always wanna have like music playing here. Um, if you're citing like it's 1995, in, in other words, the uh, gender um, uh, proportions of 1995, then your reference list will be, um, will be imbalanced in comparison to what we have now in 2022. So, a, a wonderful um, fact about our field in neuroscience is that the diversity of individuals that are contributing to our field has grown markedly over the last 25 years. Um, and so it's, uh, we, um, the gen but the gender proportions in our reference lists are not following that growing diversity at the rate that the people in our fields are changing. Um, so uh, the second factor that we've noticed is an, as a statistical explanation for what's going on is a gender imbalance in the co-authorship network of, um, so papers, authors, the, the if you have a co-authorship network that is imbalanced in terms of gender, then that partially explains the gender imbalance in in that author's citation behaviors. And people who have less imbalance in their co-authorship network tend to have reference lists that are less imbalanced. We also find, as a third explan explanatory factor, that racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorships is increasing over the last 25 years, despite greater field-wide collaboration, and that's concerning. So we can ask, or we can sort of ask what do we do about these? Well, number one, we can educate ourselves about the work of younger colleagues. So the people who have come into our field in the last five to 10 years, um, those individuals are likely from a, a broader um, set of backgrounds, uh, demographics, expertise, than those that were present in 1995. And we can, um, engage with that work in, in a meaningful way. The second thing we can do is to consider expanding our co-authorship networks and citing outside of our co-authorship networks. Other factors that explain citation disparities include um, what happens when we cite outside of our field. Um, what we find actually is that the citations that, that are in our own subfields tend to be relatively balanced more so than when we cite it to a different subfield or when we cite the general articles in like uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences or um, some of the uh, nature journals, journals that tend to be less subdiscipline specific. 
Um, so if, if you're citing in broad interest journals or you're citing a paper in a different field, you can think a little bit more carefully about whether you're doing that in a balanced way. The second thing is we've noticed that short references tend to be more imbalanced, whereas longer reference lists tend to be more balanced. Um, so the shorter reference, the, the shorter the reference list is, the more likely to be imbalanced, um, particularly in favor of man author papers. And then the third thing that we've found as an interesting correlate is the author proportions in the journal. So journals that publish a smaller fraction of papers authored by women also tend to have greater gender disparities in their reference lists. So what can we do? Well, we can educate ourselves before citing far afield or citing some of these more generic journals. We can also just cite more. That tends to be correlated with a more balanced reference list. And journals can think about publishing more equitably. The final factor, and then I'll broaden out, final factor explain, explaining citation disparities is um, papers with a citation diversity statement tend to cite differently. So what is a citation diversity statement? This is similar to um, your data availability statement or your acknowledgments. It's a little piece at the end of the paper that um, marks out uh, how you've chosen um, to engage with a scholarship in your field um, and how you particularly sought to embrace the diversity of ideas in your field. Um, what we often use in, in my lab and in others is this publicly available software where we can look at our reference lists and ask, are our reference lists actually um, um, spanning the the uh, demographics of the field in an equitable way, or they are they skewed in one way versus another. So um, interestingly, the uh, disparities um, in papers without the citation diversity statement are here shown in the dark black bars, and then the papers that have a citation diversity statement are shown in these little uh, data points here. And what you can see is that those data points are hovering around uh, the zero line. So what that means is that papers that have a citation diversity statement are citing um, according to the current def demographics in the field and who's who's publishing and what how many papers are being published. So this is a really interesting factor that's um, showing a, a marked um, amelioration of the disparities that we've observed. So um, okay, so broadening back out, and then I'd love to take questions. The citation gap is part of how we do science. As building blocks of academic careers, the citation gap is about who does science or who gets to do science. And that's because citations are often used as, used as a marker of success, as a way of determining, determining compensation and promotion, considered in grants and other funding awards, collaborative opportunities, and speaking engagements. But they're also, as building blocks of the fields of inquiry, this citation gap that we are describing, both in terms of race and ethnicity and gender, is about our collective trajectories through the space of discovery. Um, and we can think about you know, how, what that means for the way that we're mapping scholarly fields, defining spaces of inquiry, determining the scope of questions considered, and recording the history of scientific ideas. Of course, you know, what I've provided here is a description of numbers, right? Um, this is a, a statistical assessment of what's happening in our field. But the story is always for all of us, I hope, more than the numbers. It's about where and how we are citing, are we sort of slapping on references at the end or engaging with them really intellectually and deeply from the start? Um, are the references that we are putting in in some sort of long list at the end of a generic statement or set apart alone supporting a specific claim? Are we citing equitably in all of the other ways like invitations, mentions, emails, Twitter retweets, et cetera. Um, so we can think kind of a little bit more deeply beyond the numbers about how we can lay down a new practice for um, a science of tomorrow. And I think that by you know, moving from brains at the beginning of the talk to what brains do in terms of citations and understanding how we're engaging with each other intellectually, we can refocus on the pattern of connections in our fields. And by doing that, we can push the conceptual boundaries of how and by whom neuroscience is done. So with that, I'd love to thank you for listening um, and I'd be very happy to take questions. Thanks so much. Uh, well, I do the physical clap and I invite everyone to do the same or use the uh, proper emoticon. <laughs>
depending on how technological you are. Well, thank you for a very uh, great and inspiring talks. There has been um, a few questions in the chat and perhaps we can uh, start from there. Um, the, a few questions are on the first part of the talk and then a few more on the second part. So perhaps we can start from the, um, from the first one. Um, so there is a, a question from um, Alice or Alice probably, uh, Schwarz. Um, and she wrote, um, linear models are good at describing reality when we consider small changes of system, uh, that is uh, local moves in state space. When we look at things like controllability, minimum energy control, we look at trajectory in state space that are potentially non-local. Um, I worry that this is precisely for the question for which control theory is interesting, that the linear models don't describe the systems that are, we are interested in well that there is so little in terms of practical usable framework for non-linear control theory. What part of this assessment of the field is too critical in your opinion and or what is the, uh, the way forward? Yeah, thank you, um, Alice, for that question um, uh, slash set of thoughts. Um, so I do think that some of the really interesting questions are about how the brain might move. Um, non-locally on the state space, but also how the energy landscape might be changing as a function of time. And so I think that definitely requires moving to the um, time varying approaches. I think that um, I am most probably honestly excited about the middle set of models that I described for you. So where the adjacency matrix is changing itself, that's gonna alter the energy landscape on which the brain is moving. Um, but you can still use all of the um, wonderful machinery that's available for linear control. So I feel like you're getting kind of the best of both worlds um, in the sense that you can understand, you can use the machinery, but you can also start to even bring down the time scale of the adjacency matrix changing to relatively small. And then you're approaching the nonlinear model, the fully nonlinear models, right? Um, so I feel like that's a really exciting way forward. I completely take your point that um, the nonlinear models are there's there's less um, done there practically, uh, and so it requires a lot of simulation. It's hard to know why things are happening. Um, it's hard to get mathematical intuition. So not to say that we shouldn't be using nonlinear models, but that some of the benefits of the linear ones you definitely lose. Um, I also take the point about uh, the, the interesting um, Move, non-local movements in the on the energy landscape. And I just think these middle models are, for me, for me, it's the place that I'm most excited about over the next couple of years. Um, but I, I'm excited to hear, you know, what the field thinks as, as we move forward. Okay, there are then two questions on um, energy landscape. The first one is from, um, Jung Yang Kim, um, thank you for a great talk. I have a question about the energy landscape. I thought the energy landscape is related to the internal dynamics of the brain. However, in the function, you said that the energy is the dot product of you, uh, but isn't you the perturbation? Then the shape of energy landscape depends on the perturbation. So that's the first question. And the second question is from Mehran uh, Hossein Zadeh uh, Bazargani. Um, great presentation. I wonder what we mean by energy. And what kind of optimization technique are typically used to walk down the energy landscape? These are great questions. Um, so the, yeah, I wasn't careful about my use of the word energy. So I apologize for the lack of clarity there. So <clears throat> when we're talking about the minimum control energy, it is um, the dot product of U as I wrote on the slide. Um, but when I'm talking about the, the landscape that the brain is moving on, maybe I shouldn't be the, I mean energy landscape in the sense that it's going to be, it's going to require more control energy to move from one state to another. That means you're moving up a hill on the energy landscape. Um, but no, the energy, the landscape itself is actually determined by the pattern of structural connectivity um, and the model of the dynamics. And so you will have a different landscape when you have a different pattern of structural connectivity. So every person, every human, where we have a different structural connectivity matrix will have a different landscape on which they would be moving. And it would require different amounts of energy to, to move among states based on what's actually connected. 
Um, and then the second question, um, what do we mean by energy? Hopefully I clarified that a little bit, but actually I wanna add one additional piece of data, which is that when we measure the minimum control energy, we've, you know, it is a uh, computational estimate um, from a theory. And an interesting and open important question is, is that energy anything like biological energy that the brain actually uses? Um, so we do have a paper that's on bioarchive now and in revision um, at a journal, which connects the minimum control energy to um, estimates of metabolic energy as measured by FDG PET imaging. Um, and I, so I'm really excited about that because it's the first way in which we, we've been able to connect a biological marker measurement of energy and a computational theoretical um, estimate of energy. There's a lot more to do, but I think that that's the space I'm particularly excited about is, is to connect up the theory or computations with some um, you know, on the ground estimates of how energy is being used in the brain when it's really working. Okay, and then what kinds of optimization techniques are typically used to walk down the energy landscape? There's actually a bunch of different approaches. Um, I can send you, a, I'll, maybe I can put a couple papers in, in the chat. I wouldn't say that there's one approach that's being used, there's, there's, there's several. Great questions. Okay, I do have a question on the modeling side, but I, I'll just do the good chair and I will first <laughs> ask the other question and then if there is time left, I will ask it. So um, there are a few questions on the second part of your talk. So um, still from Heran, the question is about um, the slide on intersectionality. Um, when we say that these effects are driven by ethnicity, it implies a causal relation. Uh, cause and relationship. Um, I wonder how we can be sure of it being causal and not correlation. Uh, so that's the first question. Then there is a question from Suzanne Ditlevsen. Um, Thank you for a great talk. I wonder how you get data on gender and race of authors of scientific papers. And the last question on the blog somehow is from, uh, again, Alice uh, uh, Schwarz asking uh, whether you have looked um, in, well, have you looked into whether perceived prestige of institution is a factor that could drive the disparities? Yeah, great questions. Um, so let's start at the top. So when I say that the effects are driven by uh, race and ethnicity, in the sense that what we, what we, what I mean is that we see that white people are citing in a way that shows these really broad disparities by race and ethnicity. When we study the reference lists of authors of color, we find that their reference lists are, don't show as much disparity. So they're not oversighting white people as much and they're not underciting authors of color as much. We can do the same thing in terms of gender. So we, what we see is that if you just take the papers that have a man first and last author and you look at their reference lists, there's a really big gender disparity much very, very high over citation of um, man, man papers and under citation of women, women papers. And if you just look at papers that have a woman in the first and last author position, then what you see is that they're citing much closer to the zero line. So when I say driven, I mean statistically, when you separate out these groups of authors, one group shows the disparity markedly and the other does not show the disparity either as markedly or at all. Um, so, that's what I mean when I say driven. This statistical effect is driven by this group because when you study the other group, it's not there. Um, that's so that hopefully clarifies that one. Um, the second one was how do you get data on um, gender and race of authors in scientific papers? So there are two ways of doing this. Um, some people there, there are some databases where um, there's information that people have provided about themselves, um, where you can, you know, have self attestation of gender, race, and ethnicity. However, those databases are either very expensive or difficult to get or very small. Um, and so what's typically used in the field of bibliometrics or the field of science of science is to take the name of the um, authors and use um, probabilistic databases that 
us say, you know, if a person has this name, it has this probability of being a man or this probability of being a woman, either based on the sex assigned to the person at birth, so that's from the Social Security Administration database, or based on social media profiles that that person had later in life. Um, so this, uh, the, importantly, that second bit uh, helps us to account for people who are trans or non-binary or outside of the, um, the gender binary. So um, that's, that's one thing. So it's important to keep in mind that all of these data are probabilistic. This is a probability with which a person might be a woman or might be a man. And the same is true for race and ethnicity. So for every name, based on the linguistic structure of the name and particularly the by character, so how two letters in the name are next to one another, what's the probability that, for example, a Z and an L are next to one another in a name, that probability can tell you something about, uh, uh, comes from a particular uh, linguistic um, structure. And so that's where we can build from the pattern of the, the, the name itself to the predicted race or ethnicity. Um, so again, these are probabilistic. So based on my name, I might have a particular probability of being white, another probability of being Asian, another probability of being black, another probability of being Hispanic. Um, so every person has is not assigned to a single bin of race and ethnicity, but has a continuous probability of being in all bins. Uh, and you could ask the question of, um, you know, why, why would we do it that way? Um, and what benefit might that have over self-attestation? So one of the benefits of using names rather than self-attestation is that um, it is a really useful marker of how we are perceived by other people. So somebody I might have but let's say, for example, that I'm white passing but have black heritage. And so people will look at me and say, you look white. I'm going to say you like you're white. Um, well, hopefully they won't say that, but uh, there, I may be, people may engage with me because of the way that I look, right? Um, and that, so that bias in how, or that, that the bias due to perception is something that we're really interested in. Um, and that perception can be due to name, it can be due to physical appearance, it can be due to other things. The most common and broadly estimable version of that perception is by name. So name-based approximations allow us to assess um, the perception that could that could hopefully you know subconsciously um, be affecting our citation patterns. When I say hopefully, hopefully it's subconscious and not conscious. Hopefully we're not explicitly um, doing this. Okay. Is that everything. Prestige. Alice. Yes. yes. Um, so we have not assessed the prestige of institutions. I very much envision, I mean, based on your work and others, that that is probably also a, a likely part of the effect. In terms of race and ethnicity, we do account for the um, the institution itself, but not its prestige. So in the statistical model, we do re, we do um, have a regressor for the institution itself. Um, but I, I would love to dig into that data more deeply to understand um, particularly the role of prestige in the degree of over or under citation.